Hey everybody, money. Everybody likes it and most of you want more of it, especially Taproom staff. Today, we're gonna to talk about tipping, how to pay out on a daily basis to keep your team happy and how you can take your tip program into the 21st century. But first, I'd like to introduce you to Brian of Kickfin. Kickfin has been a wonderful supporter of CBP. In addition to being an industry ambassador, Kickfin's gonna be joining us in person at CBP Connects in Milwaukee this June 19th to 21st in Charleston, South Carolina, December 4th to 6th. But now, let's meet Brian. Brian, tell us a little bit more about you and a little bit more about what Kickfin solves. Andrew, you know, if I had a beer in front of me, we'd give ourselves our virtual cheers, but I don't, so we're gonna have to save it for your amazing events upcoming. So. Definitely really excited about that. I can't um, wait to have a keep our, Yeah, we keep our discussion going on kind of like what, what's our latest and greatest. I, I shared with you that I'm a Heft fan, but I'm always always uh, on the lookout for, for a new craft beer. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. We love supporting you and uh, the craft uh, beer professionals. Um, tipping, you're right. I mean, at the end of the day, it's the best way to increase employees' earnings and putting it in their pocket at the end of the shift's a big deal, especially now. And how, how does Kickfin solve that problem? Yeah, so what makes Kickfin unique? We've been in the business since 2017, and it's kind of crazy. I was actually having a beer with my co-founder at the time, and we saw this armored car pull up, and we scratched our head and we said, "What the heck is an armored car doing?" And the bartender, and as I'm sure you know, with any with any um, uh, uh, beer bartender, any waiter, waitress, any business owner, they are no stranger to sharing kind of what's on their mind and. They said, hey, no one's paying in cash. We have to get cash delivered to pay out tips. And we're in San Francisco at the time, and we saw um, Lyft and Uber using instant pay to pay out drivers. And we said, why the heck couldn't we put this in the hands of uh, hospitality outlets across the U.S.? And Kickfin was born. We are the only company in the United States, and the largest, actually, by that uh, regard, payer of real-time digital tips directly into employees' bank accounts. And so um, no pay cards, no cash, no payroll. And, and hoping to take today as an opportunity, not making this a kickfin commercial, that's the last thing we want to do, is we want to treat this as, as an educational session to talk about the variety of solutions that can be employed in the market, whether it's kickfin and whether it's a different approach. At the end of the day, when you walk away from this, you, you feel a little bit more educated on the subject matter. No, I love it. And tipping is such an important topic right now. Taproom staff and everyone's trying to make a little bit more. So I'm excited to dive in. Appreciate it, that, Andrew. I'll let you teach me a few things to get started. Right on, right on. And, and I think we were talking about this before. It's conversational. So interruptions are encouraged also from people that are, are chiming in. Please comment any questions you have. I'd love to answer them. Um, to make best use of your time, we're going to just talk about a, a few things here. Is tipping here to stay? I think we know that answer. Uh, let's talk about cash and the tip out dilemma. Let's talk about the tipping transformation. What the heck does that even mean? Um, I think we know a transformation with an analog process means taking something that's pretty archaic and modernizing it. So we'll talk about the ways that is being done today. Um, and then we'll leave you with a few takeaways, kind of six steps that you can take to modernize the process. So I think we kind of hit this uh, nail on the head at the beginning, you know, Kickfin, largest tip payout processor in the United States. I mean, we work with uh, and everybody from pizza delivery to craft breweries to stadiums to airports to restaurants, um, you name it. And, you know, what's interesting is you can't get a cup of coffee anymore and, and not have the screen flipped around asking you for a tip. Brian, I would love to have a conversation at a future time to look at tipping trends you see like across different industries. I know today we're here to talk about craft beer. So hopefully, you know, we can help everybody get a little bit higher tips and a little bit quicker tips to their bank account. But one question I do have for you is just some trends. You know, tipping, it's ingrained in our hospitality culture here in the United States. But do we see any pushback on tipping from time to time? Do you perhaps see any movement away from tipping? Or are you aware of any restaurants or breweries that have moved away from tipping? So yes, yes, and yes, and we can definitely dig in deeper over beer at your, your, your events in the, in, in the coming year uh, on this topic. But yeah, we've seen uh, groups like in San Francisco, um, there was a restaurant that said, no more tipping. We want to give uh, our team an equitable wage. We even saw Union Square Hospitality do this, and Danny Meyer experimented with this, call it a few years ago, and they reverted back to tipping. And you know, the hospitality operator's heart is in the right place. It's like, we want to make sure everybody makes more money. But when we kind of peel that onion back a little bit, what we tend to find out is the customer. The customer wants to reward. 
Um, they want to reward that hospitality uh, professional with the experience that was given to them. It's more in the reward unless I'm not penalized. It's not, hey, I, you know what? I don't think they deserve the 15 or 20%. It's more of, I want to give more because that was such an awesome experience. And I want them to know right then and there, it's not the flat 20. I saw 25%. I did a kick-ass job, so I'm going to keep doing it for, for the rest of the night. Employee morale is dependent upon it. You got one positive uh, bartender, one positive waiter, waitress. It percolates throughout the entire staff, which is, enhances the experience. And so tipping is here to stay, I have to say. Um, and it's funny because tipping, tip employers support tipping. I mean, it's contrary to you read these articles about like, oh, Starbucks turned on tipping. And, you know, the, t- the employees, by the baristas behind the counter are all upset because they just, it just, it's super awkward. I'm going to have to go out on a limb and say that, you know, that represents a micro percentage of baristas at Starbucks. It's just like, what's, what's going to get the news um, excited and, and report on the story. But they support tipping, Andrew, honestly. And one thing I love that you mentioned is, you know, experience. Craft beer is all about experience, about providing the best experience for your guests, which is done through engagement. And the guests can reward for that experience through tipping. But, you know, it's also the best experience for your team. And the more you can create an environment where your staff is happy, they're making money, they're seeing more guests, they're going to be happier. Creating that overall experience is a win-win for everybody. And tipping plays a pretty big role in it. I agree. It's like here in Austin, we're on base, and you go to Sellis Brewery up in, 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 on, the, on the north side of Austin. You're sitting down in the tap room, and the individual's walking you through the different beers, and they're, they're pushing you. They're challenging you to try new things, right, outside of your comfort zone. They're telling you why. Um, they're making the bar to actually experience new beers lower, and you kind of want to say thanks for that. And the way you can say thanks to that, that artist and to that person with that expertise is, is with the gratuity, and that gratuity is in the form of cash, um, and so it, it's here to stay. And, and I personally, you know, not just because I, I run Kickfin, but like as a consumer, I love having that as a tool in my pocket to just simply say thanks on the spot to that individual that just gave me kick ass service. Um, which, 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 I mean, this kind of goes without saying. It's like we know that tipping significantly in, increases take home pay. Um, we know this because. Let's look at some recent articles in CNN. Um, what talked about Square and Toast were reporting back data on have tips changed? The percentage of the transaction of tips changed over the past few years? And the answer is yes. And here's the crazy and surprising part is, is that in the full service restaurant environment, it's been that 20 to 22%. But as we, as we start looking into wineries, into tap rooms, into counter service establishments, it becomes a larger percentage of that transaction. Um, you're pouring me a beer for five bucks. I'm tipping two. That's 40%. You're making me a coffee for three. I'm giving you one. That's 33%. And so we all agree tipping increases take home pay. We'll thank cloud-based POS for turning the tipping option on. And now what a lot of, um, a lot of restaurants and hospitality outlets are, are thinking is, all right, now, you know, two years ago, it was like super cutting edge to, to turn on tipping. And now that was a way, great way to recruit. Okay, now everybody's doing it. All right, what's the next step? How do I just put that money in people's pockets that same day? That's that's really kind of where it's going. So I've heard that the guests are just hitting that button right in the center. Is that true? Whatever the option is in the center, is that the most frequently selected? Man, Andrew, it's funny you say this. I'm going to bring this back to taxi cabs, actually. So I was at a conference in, in Vegas, and I, I was in a taxi cab, coincidentally reading this article about the psychology of taxi cab tipping. I guess maybe I was in the cab and I was just like, I'm curious how like people tip in cabs. That's probably what it was, honestly. And the article is in psychology today and it talked about like the middle button. And so they say the, a human being doesn't necessarily want to be too cheap, but also oftentimes doesn't want to be too generous and typing in numbers and customizing something takes too much time. So they want to be a, they want to be middle of the road, not too generous, not too stingy and B, they wanted to be simple. So they hit the middle button. Here's a crazy part about that. I started going to this coffee shop. I, it used to be 15, 18, 20. Now it's 20, 22, 25. Um, so to your point, that middle button is getting hit more often than you think. And I, I think we're both guilty of it also. 
Yeah, I think we're all guilty of it. And, you know, looking at tipping, tipping goes right alongside engagement. We have that more, you know, highly engaged experience. The guest is going to order more than as a result. The tipping is going to be a bit higher. You know, wearing my secret hopper hat, I dove into some data recently. And, you know, looking at low engagement versus high engagement, you know, that experience, Brian, when you go there, the staff goes to the motion. They don't really care. It's, it's not really the time you're going to say, oh, my gosh, that person was so amazing. But it was all right versus the experience you go and you're like, wow, I got the best service ever from Brian. When you receive high engagement versus low engagement, we see that the average spend in breweries is 30% higher when you have the time to, you know, build that rapport with the guests and the guests appreciates that. You know, when you get those tabs even higher, the guest is going to tip on it. So it makes more money for the staff. So it's a win-win for everybody. I want to add, I want to add some color here. Um, Adam here was, was kind enough to, to, to comment on, um, you know, I'll just read it verbatim. I hate how tipping has crept into almost every form of electronic tipping. I wish people could embrace a stable, reliable wage, regardless of industry. I, I, going back to my comments a few, a few minutes ago, man, Adam, I couldn't agree more with you. N no question. Here's the challenge. The challenge is there's only so much um, somebody will pay for a pint of beer, and there's only so much somebody will pay for a burger and fries. If you're charging me 15 bucks for a value meal, you're charging me $8 for that pint of beer versus five using those numbers as examples. I can do that. I can pay a higher wage to you. But the challenge is as independent operators, you have a, a certain margin you have to have just to keep the lights on, right? Because we know that individuals in your area are going to pay six bucks for a pint. They're not going to pay 10. And that 10 would make individuals earn a li livable wage. Okay. We got to get people in the door. So we keep the lights on so we can continue our passion so we can keep people employed, so we can pay them. Well, what if we turn on tipping voluntarily to the customer? They're giving kick-ass service, let them make more. So, man, Adam, I agree with you um, with that comment. Um, we just have to kind of bring it back to what price is a consumer comfortable paying for a product that will allow that to happen? And if we've reached that threshold, what can we do to put it in the customer's hands to give them a little something extra? Which brings us to the third point here. It's that like the guests want the opportunity to reward good service. I want to bring this quote here. So we actually had a Scott here. He's the COO of the Brass Tap. Um, we were at FS Tech. This is uh, back in September. And he was kind enough to sit on the panel. And so they looked actually at doing away with tipping altogether. And they got pushback from employees, of course. But I mean, it's interesting. The biggest pushback that the brass had this is a pretty large organization. We're, we're from the customers. Um, the customers, the guests were saying, we want the ability to reward service. We want the ability to compensate that individual. Uh, that affects our experience as a patron. And so we're not, I'm not one to necessarily say, here's what I think and why. And in, in, in kind of addressing Adam's last question, I want to share anecdotes and I want to share stories with well-respected operators in the field. They went down a path and here's what they found. And we're here to share that today with you guys. No, that's fascinating, Brian. Thanks for sharing that quote. So um, this becomes the, the question, uh, is it possible to make it equitable through different tipping policies? I tell you what, you've seen one tipping policy. You've seen one tipping policy. Everybody does it entirely differently. And we're more than happy to offer up some best practices, but I can't even begin to talk about the different permutations of like tip share policies down to like, it's Sunday night. If five, greater than five are on staff on Sunday night, if we have an oyster special, oysters that are sold are tipped at, it gets, it gets wild. So uh, on today's, today's conversation, we're going to share some best practices. I'm like keeping it simple. Um, yeah. But we can get complicated if you want to. Yeah, if anybody has a question, drop them in the chat. Brian's here to help. And, you know, speaking of questions, Brian, you've got me thinking about something. We've had so many conversations in CBP around tipping, you know, particularly about how brewery teams are paying out the tips. Can you walk me through some of the challenges that breweries are struggling with when it comes to tip distribution? Yeah, well, there's, 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 there's a ton of challenges here. Um, a lot of the challenges involve, well, everybody's using credit card, so we don't have enough cash coming in. Um, some challenges are, are, I don't know how to split these up correctly. Um, other challenges are, are, hey, we're putting tips on payroll, and but, you know, it's, we're, it, it's just a challenge to hire and recruit and retain because we're going after the same individuals that are going to work, work across the street at this bar or at this restaurant that's paying daily. Um, let's, use the, let's use Texas and other some, some states as an example. 
Um, not saying those listening are doing this, but legally in the state of Texas and many other tip credit states, they can pay certain employees $2.13 per hour if they're tip eligible and take advantage of the tip credit. Well, as a result, that means the lion's share of your take-home earnings are from tips. And so in the services industry, in the hospitality industry, the uh, culture is um, gra instant gratification and, and as well it should be. I mean, it's a freaking hard job you're doing, really hard job. You should be rewarded every single day. And so when we look at Texas as an example, this is a state where, where a lot of restaurants are paying out uh, in, in real time. It's just been the culture for the last 10 or 20 years, along with the other 45 states that fall into this category. So for other hospitality outlets that aren't doing that, it puts them at a disadvantage. So kind of anchored into Andrew, kind of what I said is, is there's just, everyone's using credit card. I mean, honestly, I can't even remember the last time I had cash in my wallet. If I had cash in my wallet, I am spending it on stuff I should not be spending it on. I'll come home with a bag of, I don't know, who knows what. And my wife looks at me like I'm crazy. It's because I had $20 <laughs> in my wallet. Um, so it's interesting. These are some of the questions that we got um, from, I believe, uh, your, your Facebook group or your, it was your Facebook group, right? Yeah. Um, into EP. I recognize this. Yeah, so we want to share some of these questions. I think because they're, they're important kind of to address here in, in real time. It's This is from a front of the half employees. Hey, we pool tips daily. We're good with the tip pooling. How do you pay out credit card tips? Do you pay it out in cash at the end of the night? Or do you pay it on paycheck? What's well, customary? Um, I'm going to answer this in two parts. I kind of did a little bit earlier. If we look at traditional full service restaurants and bars, non-tap rooms, what is customary is paying it out in real time. We're not talking about fine dining. We're not talking about, you know, 11 Madison Park in New York City. We're talking about full service restaurants and bars. They're paying it out daily. Now, I bring this up because we talked to a lot of tap room um, operators that are doing it on payroll. And we have been asking them, like, who are you competing uh, for talent with? Are you competing for talent with the fine dining restaurant? Or are you competing for talent with the bar down the street? And they say, well, uh, you know, they're, they're knowledgeable when it comes to our product and no beer, we're, we're, we're competing with that individual that works on, down at the bar down the street. It's like, okay, so you are accepting tips. It is ingrained. That's how they earn a majority of their income. They need to be paid out daily. I will say that we're seeing a big shift with tap rooms moving from paycheck to daily because the, of the challenges associated with acquiring labor. But they'll only pay it out daily if it's easy. If it's going to be like I'm running a Bank of America and I'm sitting in the line to get a sack of cash and running across the street and keeping a safe count, they're not going to do it. Um, but as they become more educated in options, and we'll talk about options, not just kickfin that you can look at, um, they realize that, well, well, shoot, like we can actually achieve this sim simply and, and give the employees what they want. Okay, so like I'm always, I'll talk, I like to talk about the flip side. Um, let's talk about this individual that commented and said, man, I just cannot imagine doing this daily. It's like the added labor, the cash on hand, the risk, it's, it, there's going to be a mistake. So first off, Brian, I'm so glad that Kickfin is in tune with the comments section of CBP because there's so much great insight that you know shows you what the beer industry is thinking right now. So thank you all for diving into these. I'm excited to learn the answers myself. Yeah. And you know what? I'm going to tell you what I is, man, I could not agree more with whoever wrote this. It's like payroll versus cash. I mean, yeah, I, if those are the two options. I'd pick payroll, obviously, for every single reason this individual outlined. No question. This post is spot on. Um, but I will say is it's let's get educated today on other approaches that are as simple as payroll what achieves the results that the employees are looking for, which is getting it in real time. So I agree with this post wholeheartedly when you're looking at payroll versus cash, but let's learn about some other options out there. And the reason for that is when we look at cash tips, I mean, if you, any of you guys have ever worked in hospitality and have dealt with cash tips, you know, these are the problems running to the, 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 the bank every week or every day using armored car to deliver cash if they show up, um, the risk for theft. Now, imagine like you got $10,000 and you put it into a safe and somebody knows the code. How the heck are you going to know 
that the full stack or a part of that stack is in there. You're trusting these manual ledgers. Then you got these employees waiting on the clock, waiting for their cash. Some people are rounding up because they don't have coins in their safe. And then, hey, this all goes over to your accountant and payroll. And they're just like, this is just a pain in the ass to deal with. Um, and so that's why when you talk to a lot of people that run tap rooms, they're like, dude, no, 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 no. And no, I'm not doing any of that. I'm doing payroll because I, I, I got better things to, do, to deal with than deal with like physical currency. So I'm going to put on payroll. And we talked about this, like putting on payroll is way better than cash. So if any of you guys are like, I'm looking at payroll or cash, you go, you go payroll. We're going to show you a different way. Uh, but employees want to be paid every single day. They do. I mean, think about the people that you're competing to, to attract to your business. I mean, you can't go anywhere anymore um, and, and hear the word instant. Whether somebody's paying you and you want it right away in Venmo, PayPal, or Square Cash app, or the pizzeria is hiring drivers and they're paying them instantly, um, or a bar across the street is doing it the old school way in cash, people want their money right away. It's ingrained in the culture. Yeah, and I there's a big risk. Love, of, I think we all love that instant gratification. Yeah, and I tell you what, and, and here's the challenge too. It's like we all have like things that come up that we need money for. Shoot, like a uh, health insurance copay, a flat tire, something just came up. I need money right away. I can't wait until my next paycheck. I feel really awkward going to my GM and asking for an advance. I don't want to walk them tell them my personal details as far as why I need this. I don't want them to think. A, B, or C, um, it, it's just, it, it creates a lot of employee stress. So there's a way that we can actually get them money in real time, satisfy that instant gratification, but also like put them in a position where they're not looking for another opportunity that does impact pay them daily. And that, that's, that's huge. So Brian, I've got another so again, question. Yeah. yeah, please, Andrew. Yeah, let's make a little conversational. So everything about cash we're learning, it comes with a lot of problems. I mean, even looking back to a past career, I ran a food service for a long time. I would travel all over the country working at events. And I would leave these events with a backpack full of cash, which just seems like a terrible idea. So anything that can be done to prevent the amount of cash on hand seems like a great you know, win in the safety department, first off. But then, you know, diving a little bit deeper into the other problems that cash presents, it seems like switching to payroll means people don't get instant access to their earnings. You know, what kind of impact does that have? And why does the instant access matter? It, it matters because, and, and, for, and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually add something to that backpack full of cash story, because that's hilarious. <laughs> um, but that uh, instant access to cash is huge. It's huge for the reasons of, I got this unexpected expense coming up, or man, I was not planning on going here or doing this, or even just, I've had a really, really hard day working today. I busted my ass. I did a double. I am exhausted. I did it because I need the money. And then I get paid at the end of my shift. And it's way more than I was expecting. It really just rewarded me for exactly the work that I, that, that I put forth. So I think that gratification is, is huge. Um, now going, back, now, going back to that comment of backpack full of cash. So everybody on our, our sales team, they're all, they all have a hospitality background. And I, I don't mean selling hospitality technology. I mean, like, I've actually bartended, waited tables, et cetera. And so we, a lot of, in the interview process, we asked them, hey, why did you end up working at, at KickFan? And they said, the shoebox of cash has come up multiple times where it's like, when I heard about this product, it's like, man, this would be a lifesaver. I used to have a shoebox. I had a shoebox full of cash. Chili's would pay me every single day. I'd stuff this shoebox in the back of my drawer or in my, in my closet. And it's whenever I could get to the bank uh, to deposit cash. So like you leaving with a backpack pack full of cash. I mean, that is, that is not an uncommon story in this space. Let me tell you. And that, that was only the abbreviated story. It got into a messy situation and I'm glad alternatives exist these days. Man, it's uh, <laughs> it's just kind of just crazy, crazy to think about because I know we're like my mother was in that we were in the our family's in the service business, and she would come home. She was a waitress, and she'd come home with just like stacks of cash. And I still kind of like imagine that I'm like, my gosh, like that. It, it's just crazy to know that was like 30 years ago, and that's like still happening today. Um, but like how we paid our 
employees have never like really mattered more. I mean, this is what happened during COVID. So during COVID, um, a lot of restaurants closed down, a lot of bars closed down, some open for limited services, limited service, less tables, tables had to be moved outside. People had to get really creative. And as a result, there's less employees working per shift because there were less tables per shift, meaning every dollar that they earned became like very critical to their well-being. They used to work 40 to 50 hours a week. Now they're lucky to get their 15 hours a week. So they are hustling. And so how we've paid them has never mattered more. Now, things have changed, right? We're not in COVID anymore. But what, that had, what had happened as a result of that is employees have became educated on the importance of like real time and getting it real time. And what if this happens again? Or how am I planning for this? And am I, am I with an employer that has tools to deliver this in real time in the event that my shifts get cut, the restaurant closes, and I can only work um, select days? So going back to like me, me kind of clapping for that payroll tipper at the beginning on your Facebook page. And like, I agree, it shouldn't be an operational burden. It needs to be a benefit. If you're going to pay people out, make it simple, make it simple for them, make it simple for you. And if it's not simple, put it on payroll at the end of the day. Um, <clears throat> it lets you get those people in your tap room working. It lets you attract and, and retain more employees. In fact, if they don't ask the question when you're interviewing them, tout that as a retention tool. Um, I'm here in, in, in Austin. I drive down Lamar, and there's a billboard saying get paid instantly if you work at Southside Flying Pizza. And so people are using instant as a way to attract and retain employees. It's, it's competitive. Uh, but at the same time, we need to make sure that it's simple. A lot of the people, a lot of these tap rooms we work with, they have one GM or they have seven employees. They're not looking to add new systems. They're not looking to make things more complicated. They get the value. They just don't want to deal with the work. And I don't blame them. I wouldn't either. Yeah, um, I think you nailed it right there, Brian. You know, brewery owners and managers, they wear so many different hats and retention is so important. They don't want to have to be hiring all the time. If you can offer, you know, an instant solution like this to keep your team happy or allowing that manager or owner to focus on the other things that matter and are important to the brewery. So um, let's see here. So when we talk about the digital tipping landscape, like I mentioned at the beginning of this, this is not a kick fin commercial. This is about telling you like what's out there, whether you work with us, pay cash, use pay cards, put it on payroll. Um, so let's talk about like what's available for you to actually even evaluate. Um, there's instant and there's pay cards. So um, really kind of the difference between that is a direct to bank, or are you giving your employees an actual physical prepaid debit card? So there's really kind of a few ways to evaluate that model. But before I kind of dive into that, I do want to highlight um, a few things, a um, few things being directed employees that are being handed a gift card. They'd probably rather have their tips on payroll because it's right in their own bank account. That's why we haven't seen a ton of traction in the pay card market. If you look at a lot of the employees in the tap room, they're banked, they have their own bank accounts, they want money where they spend it. So as you evaluate, if you're in an environment where your employees are heavily unbanked and don't have bank accounts, then the prepaid card or pay card model is likely ideal for you. Um, if you are in an environment where they have a B of A account or a Wells Fargo account, then a direct to bank is likely a better solution because you're putting the money where, where they want it. Cool. Uh, so what are we doing? We're um, what's working, what's not, let's go ask managers, you know, what's, what's, is there a pain in the process? What are we hearing from employees? If you're doing it in cash, how big of a pain in the neck is it? How much time are you spending? And if you're doing it on payroll, do you think your employees would actually get a boost in morale? Do you think it would help us recruit and retain employees? This is big guys, like compliance, compliance is key. So as we start looking at like adding tipping as an option, it's super important to be cognizant of all the different regulations, um, period. Um, there's many, and we can definitely have a side conversation about it, but I'll use an example. Um, so in the state of, Texas, you can pass through the credit card processing fees associated with collecting that cash tip. So I'm at the tap room. 
I got a you know fifty dollar tab. I tip ten on it. Um, if I'm paying the ten dollar, me as the tap room owner, I'm paying merchant credit card processing fees on that sixty bucks, not on the fifty. So in Texas and forty five other states, I can pass through that credit card processing expense to the employee. California, you can't do that. Um, so that's just one example of many. So as you roll out a tipping program, how do we take advantage of tip credit or not? Can we pass through fees or not? And there's many, many, many other aspects beyond just, let me just turn the button on. And I love how at the very bottom in parentheses, you have consult legal counsel, because that is so important. Andrew, there's not, there's, there, there's not enough beers in any tap room that, that that'll make me want to go to law school. So that is definitely on there uh, for, for the, the, the listeners here. Uh, we can provide advice. We can provide best practices. We can share what our clients are doing. Um, but at the end of the day, we need that rubber stamp by your employment attorney. Tip pooling. Um, so pros and cons, like what's the advantage? So like there's kind of two approaches like, hey, direct tip my employee, like in Minnesota, for example, and then they can choose where those funds go. Now, that's a state law right there. Um, or we can look at, you know, let's, let's create equity here. We know that we don't want to dedicate um, one bartender, uh, one server to an individual customer for us to optimize the customer experience. We need, you know, three touch, three different people touch one guest or everybody's working in tandem. This is great because it a, provides a great uh, customer experience, meaning different points of view, service is always on. And then two, from a revenue standpoint, likely you're turning tables quicker as well. So everybody benefits from that standpoint, from a pooling perspective. There's various ways of doing this. You can do it in the basic sense of like quick service restaurants. This is a common model where, hey, it goes into a pool and then everybody, and it's sliced up based on hours worked. Super simple. Uh, this is great if in your tap room, you've got you know, five bartenders and there's only five bartenders and perhaps there's no barbacks and you're all kind of sharing the workload and you're all sharing the tips. Great model to split it by hours. And at one of our recent virtual conferences, your co-founder, Justin, actually joined us for a conversation on tipping, which we heard a lot of breweries are shifting towards that tip pool model. For sure. For sure. It just delights. The, it's a better customer experience, delights them. And operators see it from top line revenue growth, like they're able to actually sell more. The guests are engaged. If they need to turn the tables quicker, it's just it's it's just optimal all around. Uh, points based. Now, points based is super simple and actually more common than you think. Uh, this is typically employed when there's three or four um, different positions. They weight them. They're like, okay, a waiter gets two points, a busser gets one point, and then the host gets a half of a point. And they accumulate these points. And based on points earned, they split up the tip pool. Um, so that's very common in situations where there are a larger variety of, uh, of, um, of roles. So not as prevalent in the tap room. We don't have a lot of tap rooms that we know doing the points model, but I felt that it'd be prudent to share that. Really interesting. And percentage based, it's okay, we're just going to go ahead and split based off of percentages. Hey, you've collected uh, these tips. We're going to give 5% to the bar back. You keep 95%. It can be as simple as that. And then to my crazy oyster example at the beginning, it's pretty complex. Love it. <clears throat> and then, you know, as you roll out a solution, you want to make sure it's, it's, it's safe, it's protected. It, using that safe, the nice part about payroll is you run it, it's done. Bad part about cash is people have access to a safe and you don't know what's in the safe or who's touched it. So it's important if you're doing anything in real time and digital, you actually have a ledger and you're able to reconcile it and track it down to the penny. And then give your, give your employees options. Um, we have a, a lot of clients that say, you know what, we, we, we love what you're offering, but we don't want to do it for everybody. We want to give the employees the choice. And we're all about choice. At the end of the day, who doesn't like choice within anything they buy or anything that they, they may receive? And so um, give them the option. Oh, you want it on payroll because you like getting that big check every two weeks or you like this at, at the end of every shift because it helps you with any incidental um events that may come up, 
Um, it's important to find a provider that allows you one single interface to do it on payroll and to do it in real time. And actually be, be smart about this. So here's the crazy part about like, I think you guys know this with merchant services and credit card processing. I mean, talk about like a business that's, you know, not, not the best feeling when you're getting credit card processing set up. You just feel you get this, this contract and it's got like size four aerial font. You can barely read it. And the devil's in the details until you get your bill. And six months later, the bills increase. You don't know why. And they won't return your calls. These horror stories. I hope you don't experience, but they're pretty common. Um, I think it's, it's important to understand whomever you work with, make sure the contract's simple, make sure there's no setup fees, make sure there's no long-term agreements, make sure it's month to month, make sure it's easy to get set up, um, and then check the references in your industry, CBP or others, on like, who's using it? Why are they using it? Do they like it? How responsive are they? Like, this is people's money. If like, things go sideways, is it I, the tap room owner that's dealing with these questions, or is there a dedicated support team that'll, that'll help out? So um, and I think that's a little hack that I set up Brian a while ago, you know, you mentioned it yourself, you know, where can you get the best recommendations and feedback from your peers? So actually on the CBP website, when you look at our individual partners, you can click on their name and it'll show you every reference of that company in CBP. So you can know, you know, the good, the bad, everything that people are talking about right then and there. So Andrew, I love that because at the end of the day, it's even when we're shopping for our company, um, there are these generalist review websites that I can look at, or I can go to um, a site that my peers are on. Every use case is different. This is not a session that we're talking to fine dining operators. We're talking about top tap room operators. This is like apples and oranges here. And to hear what people are doing, this is why we wanted to share those Facebook comments because there's a lot of great discussion happening on your social platform that'll help kind of guide you and, and allow the collaboration between not just what we're talking about today, but just in general, um, as it pertains to just the brewery world as a whole. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, the kind of the last step is when you start looking at implementing anything, this is kind of really like a catch all just in general, not just like what we're talking about today is it's all about communication. It's all about understanding the why behind the change, communicating that to your employees, getting feedback. This also goes back to my last slide on, the, on whatever you end up doing, never have a contract because at the end of the day, it's two things. One, if something doesn't want to work, if something doesn't work out, you want to be able to leave and go back or try something else. And number two, the contracts to me baffle me because no one has a contract to walk into your tap room to order a beer every Sunday or every Saturday or every Friday. So just as the, the rules that you play by with your business should be the same rules that software companies play by as well, there should never have to be any long-term commitment. And at any point in time, you're not happy with what you're getting, don't use that software again. Don't get that beer. Buy another piece of software. Go to a different tap room. We feel that the, the playing field should be the same for both suppliers um, and purchasers alike. So that's super important as well. And then measuring the ROI is at the end of the day and working with a company, and this is not just what we're talking about today, just in general, that will help you look back retrospectively as what did we spend for the service, if anything? What was the result in hard and soft dollar cost? And do I want to keep using this solution? So Brian, while everybody else gets their questions ready for you about tipping and beyond, you know, I've got a question for you. You know, you're a beer lover yourself. You mentioned that earlier. When you go to a brewery and you have that wow experience, what does that look like for you? And that, that experience that's going to make you want to tip a little bit more. What type of engagement or, you know, aspects do you look for? Uh, yeah. So I'm going to go back to a recent experience uh, that I heard that, that I had in East Austin. Um, and it was at, um, let's see, Central Machine uh, Works over there in Cesar Chavez. And man, that tap room, if you guys are in Texas or in Austin, that tap room is super cool. Um, and so we get to the counter and, you know, I, like I mentioned before, Andrew, I love half, I love wheat beers. And having somebody behind the counter kind of challenge you a little bit and say, hey, have you, have you tried our red ale? Have you tried our stout? Oh, you know, I'm not really a big stout fan. He goes, no, no, ours is a little different. Here's how it's made. Here's the story behind it. Uh, you know what? Let me pour you without you saying a yes or a no. 
uh, taking that taster cup, pouring you that little taste, you try it. Now, whether you like that, whether you don't, it, it's beyond the point. The point is, is that individual served up a new experience, gave you the opportunity to taste something different that you normally would not have tried. Um, I walked away feeling educated. I walked away feeling excited. And I walked away saying, that was a damn good experience. I am going to tip big on this one here because not because he was sitting in front of me and he was just quick at just refilling my half and just getting it, but because he took the time and you saw and felt the passion behind the craft to actually go one-on-one -on -one and educate me on this is something we're proud of. And I'd love to share the story about it. Yeah. And now you've become an advocate for that brewery. And I imagine you're looking to go back as soon as you can. I mean, that place is uh, one of my favorites here locally. So absolutely. Oh, I love it. With so many good options, we're all craving those places where you can get that overall experience and you're going to end up tipping more and your staff will be happier because of it. So Brian, you know, for anyone looking to learn more about Kickfin, where can they do so? Uh, Kickfin.com, if it's easier for you. We, we talked a ton and, you know, a lot of times um, it's kind of hard to digest, hard to retain. Um, you can either check out Kickfin.com. You can email me, Brian at Kickfin, B-R-I-A-N at Kickfin.com. If you're, you can even text tips to 33777. If you text it, there's a really cool guide. I talk about the six ways of like evaluating your tipping program. There's that in there and more uh, with some awesome uh, customer references from the space. I think you get some good value out of it. So either one of those ways described is, is super simple and easy. Awesome. Well, Brian, is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, no, we just love supporting you guys. We feel honored that you had us on the show today. Uh, I hope that we provided some value to the people taking the time out of their busy day to listen to what we had to, had to say. And if I can be a resource at all, we'll be at both of those shows um, this year. You can always drop me a line. It doesn't even have to be product related. It can be like policy related or just completely just, hey, we're also in Austin and check out. We're way better than, you know, so-and-so. Uh, let me know. We'd love to hear from you. Well, I haven't been out to Austin before, so I definitely look forward to someday coming out there and having a beer with you and having a great experience. But I can't wait to you know, see you all on the KickFin team in Milwaukee and Charleston. So, Brian, thank you so much for the support. This has been a fantastic talk today. And enjoy the Hefeweizen later tonight. I'll see you soon. Great, Andrew. Thanks, Andrew. Cheers.